Christ is risen. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. Welcome to Christ Presbyterian Church. We're glad you're here celebrating to us, with us today the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. Every Sunday we celebrate this, but this is a particular day that we get to lean into it and just celebrate with our family and friends, so we're glad you're here. Our hope today at CPC is that the gospel is the a forefront of this service, that God is a forefront, that you're going to hear the good news of Jesus Christ in our singing, in the, in the prayers that we pray today, in, uh, in the confession and the assurance that we have today, in the sermon, praise God, that you hear the good news in that, in the word of God, in the scriptures read that you hear that, that it's just covered with the good news that you know for sure and have heard it what Jesus has done and who Jesus is for you today. And all of this is meant for us to give him thanks and to give him all the glory in all that we do today. But before we do that, right, we give him thanks and praise and we adore him, but man, we ought to confess who he is and confess who we are. And so at our church, we usually begin with a prayer of confession, followed by a moment of silent repentance and then the gospel. Would you please join me in the prayer of confession this morning. Almighty God, you have raised Jesus from the grave and crowned him Lord of all. 
we confess that we have not bowed before him or acknowledged his rule in our lives. We have gone along with the way of the world and failed to give him glory. Forgive us and raise us from the sin, that we may be your faithful people, obeying the commandments of our Lord Jesus Christ, who rules the world and is head of the church, his body. Amen. Friends, we have all experienced the ramifications of sin in this world. People have harmed us. We have deep hurt and pain. We have harmed others as well. And we see people hurting and harming others day in and day out. But here's what Jesus says, is all this is true. But what he really goes after is that inside of you is broken. It's not just outside. It's just not everyone else. It's in our heart and desires is broken. You see, Proverbs says, there's a way that seems right to a person, but in the way, in the end, it leads to death. And all of us think we got the right way or the right path. But God knows that this sin inside of us, this, this separation, this doing our own thing and not acknowledging him, creates a separation between him. And the penalty for that is death, which is separation from him. But God is not okay with that because he loves you. Hear this very clearly. He loves you. He adores you. He cherishes you. You exist because of him. And he doesn't want you to perish. And so he took upon all the sin on the cross, your sin on the cross, and he took your penalty, the wrath of the Father that you deserve, that we deserve. He took it upon himself so that you and I may never experience that. He died, and he was buried in a tomb, separated. But he defeated sin. He defeated your sin completely, he vanquished the evil one. He has conquered death. Friends, he is alive. He is alive and he is present today. He is always present. You exist and breathe and are here because he is present and wills it to be. He is victorious. And his mercy is for you. Don't leave this place without acknowledging what he's done and who he is and grabbing hold of that mercy and grace later on if you want you can talk to me about that we'll have the elders come up and you can talk to them as well do not leave do not leave understanding without understanding and accepting and acknowledging that jesus died for you and he rose for you out and he lives for you right now brothers and sisters Friends, know that you are forgiven. Amen. And as Abel. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray, find in me thy all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white. Change 
the leper's box and melt the heart of stone. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left the crimson stain. Jesus died my soul to save, my lips shall still repeat, Jesus paid all, all to him I owe, sin had left the crimson state, he washed it white as snow. Alive, 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 hallelujah, alive. 
of my praise. Glory is the one who has overcome the grave. Let the people dance, let the people sing. Worthy is the mighty King. He's alive, 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 hallelujah, alive. Praise and glory to the Lamb. Worthy is the one who has overcome the grave. Let the people dance, let the people sing. Worthy is the mighty King. Worthy is the Lamb, worthy of our praise. Worthy is the one who has overcome the grave. Let the people dance, let the people sing. Worthy is the mighty King. You may be seated. Amen. We worship a generous God. He is generous with his love, his promises, his steadfastness, and his provision in our lives. Our response to his generosity is to give cheerfully and generously back to our loving provider. One of the ways that you can give this morning is to leave your offering in the plate found at the back of the sanctuary. We thank you, God, and praise you for the faithfulness and generosity of your people. And we pray that you would bless this offering and lead us to use it in accordance with your will. Amen. We are a community that wants to know your burdens and your troubles, as well as your thanksgivings and your praises. And so we invite you to text your prayer request to the number 413-299-2100. You can also share your requests by speaking with one of the elders this morning. Won't you join me in prayer? Father God, you are rich in mercy, and because of your great love for us, you have made us alive together with Christ. You have called us out of darkness into the light, and we thank you for your son, Jesus, who is light and life. And yet, Lord, we confess that we sometimes forget your call to live in the light. Our hearts are hardened, our minds are darkened, and our relationships dead with bitterness and anger. Send your Holy Spirit to our aid to soften our hearts, to bring light to our minds and our souls, and to resurrect our relationships by stirring us to reconciliation and rooting out all anger and bitterness. We pray that you would strengthen marriages and families and grant us peace in our homes. Heavenly Father, we ask for comfort for those that are grieving. You are the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles. May your presence be felt by those full of hurt or loss and give the grieving an eternal hope. We pray for all those in our congregation and families with needs of healing. Grant patience and encouragement to those that endure chronic struggles of illness, of pain, depression, and anxiety. While we wait on you for full healing and full restoration, remind us that we are not enslaved to these conditions that plague us. For you, Lord Jesus, have set us free from a yoke of slavery. Help us to stand firm, joyful in the eternal hope and the weight of your glory. Lord God, our hearts break for those that don't know you or for those that have turned from you. We pray for boldness to share who you are. May the words that we speak and the lives we lead be a testimony of who you are and of the love you have poured out on us. Merciful God, your word assures us that you stoop down to listen and hear our prayers. We thank you for hearing our requests, and we have prayed all these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. As we continue in worship this morning, we have an amazing opportunity to continue to give him the praise, to celebrate the risen Lord and what he has done for us. I invite you to please stand and join us as we sing God is for us. We won't fear the battle. We won't fear the night. We will walk the valley with you by our side. You will go before us. You will lead the way. Say. 
I know you just sat down, but would you please stand for the reading of the word? <laughs> A reading this morning is from Matthew chapter 12, verses 38 through 42. Hear these words from Matthew chapter 12, verses 38 through 42. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him, saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. But he answered them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. The Queen of the South will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, Something greater than Solomon is here. This is the word of our Lord. Be to God. 
Heavenly Father, silence in us and in Tracy any voices but your own so that we may clearly hear your word. Guide us through your word and your Holy Spirit that in your light we may see light, in your truth find freedom, and in your will discover peace. Grant us humble and obedient hearts that respond to what you reveal to us through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I'm going to have you stand. No, I'm just st <laughs> st stay, st stay seated. Um, I forgot to say this, but I, we love children in our service. We love uh, the sound of it, so parents don't freak out about it. It will not bother me. It will bother you the most. Uh, but there is a worship table back there, uh, so if you want to help engage your child, if they need you, that there's paper and crayons back there. There's also these hard clipboard things you can bring it back to where you're sitting. And I would encourage uh, children, if they want to draw a picture of what the, uh, my sermon's about, I would love to see that picture after the service. Uh, so that's a way. There's also a nursery in the back for zero to three. It's not staff, but if you need to pull your kid back out and be with them for a moment and then come back in, you're more than welcome to do that. If you're an adult, uh, this needs to gather themselves and step out. You're more than welcome to do that too and come back in when you're ready. Uh, In late December of 1980, Wally Nelson from Langby, Minnesota, awoke to find the body of a 19-year-old girl named Dean Hillard, frozen, solid as a log, on his doorstep. Dean sat on his doorstep outdoors in minus 22-degree weather. Wall brought Dean to the hospital, where to everyone's disbelief, she was revived with no more damage than a few blistered toes. Hillard became an instant celebrity. She toured local churches. Talk shows flew her around the country. She was on the Today Show, of all things. But once the attention died down, Hillard said the experience really didn't change her. It really didn't change the trajectory of her life. Almost everyone else said and told her that it was a miracle that she was saved. She said she kept waiting for something dramatic to happen. But her life has been pretty normal after the fact. She got married. She had kids. She moved to a mid-sized town in Minnesota. She works at Walmart. Hiller believes things would have turned out differently for her if she could remember those six hours that she spent frozen. If she'd seen anything dramatic in those moments, this is what she said. It's like I fell asleep and woke up in the hospital. I didn't see the light or anything like that. It was kind of disappointing. So many people talk about that, and I didn't get anything. Neil Postman, once again, another 1980s reference, wrote a book called Amusing Ourselves to Death. The premise of this book in 1980 was that we as a society medicate ourselves and constantly distract ourselves to the reality around us. And he wrote this before there were things called smartphones. <laughs> before the proliferation of laptops. Before YouTube or TikTok. We have only accelerated Postman's vision of distracting ourselves. Distracting ourselves from the truth around us. Even with 30 second a minute shorts. Chesterton said, the world is not lacking in wonders. But in a sense of wonder. God is not less in the world today. I want you to hear that very clearly. God is not less in the world today. We are less observant. God is not less present in the world today. God is present. We are less present in the world today. We're less present with each other and with him. We are unable or unwilling to recognize or identify God because we lack a sense of wonder and awe and have been deadened 
and dull by the noise and entertainment around us. Yet when troubles and hardships hit, and we know they do, don't they? We look for God. We look for help. We look for refuge and we look for hope. But we're unable to find God in those moments because our senses and our imaginations have been dulled and blind to the reality of God around us in every other moment. And so, in those hard times, we go back to our devices and to our own devices. What do you need to recognize God? What do you need to recognize Jesus? Let's turn to Matthew 12, verses 38. Matthew 12, verse 38, in your Bible, on your phone, in the pew Bible. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him and said, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. I just want to give you the setting here. The Pharisees have seen, these are the religious leaders of the time, those that were supposed to be connected to God the most, that knew the law the most, that were in charge of the synagogues or the temple. They said, they have seen Jesus heal people. They have seen Jesus cast out demons. They have seen many signs from Jesus. They have heard his teaching in which they claim he preaches with power and authority, which they have not seen anyone else do. And yet, Just before this passage, they claim Jesus, who cast out a demon, did it by the power of Satan and not from God. And now they ask him, we want a less ambiguous sign from you. We want something that we can really know it's from God, a sign from heaven. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 1.22, for the Jews demand signs. And Greeks seek wisdom. The rest of the world, this, this Greek world at the end, they demand like this in powerful teaching and wisdom and wisdom. But the, but the Jews, they want to see signs that you are God or you, you're from God, you're a prophet from God. Matthew 16, 1, similar to this verse. Is, and the Pharisees and Sadducees, Sadducees, another religious group, came and to test Jesus, they asked them, show, him, show them a sign from heaven. How many signs do you need to see? What sign are you looking for? If you ask God, like, I want to see a sign, what sign are you looking for? And how many signs do the Pharisees need to see? How many signs do you need to see before you believe? What are those signs? What would be the sign that you could say, that's God? He's present, He's at work. Verse 39. But Jesus answered him, an evil and adulterous generation seeks a sign, but no sign will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. The point that Jesus is trying to make is the Pharisees are missing the greatest sign from God. And it's not in all his actions and all the things that he's done that point to that he is God, but that he actually is physically present with them. Jesus is the sign. Jesus is the revelation of God. He is present. He is the invisible God made visible, and they're asking for a sign. They can't recognize God in front of them. They can't recognize his actions. They can't recognize his teachings. They can't recognize he's present. Jesus is the sign right in front of them, and they ask, can you show us more proof? Can you give us a clear evidence of who you are? Any of us that have ever had children or have children, right, or ourselves, or maybe you have uh, have a husband, uh, and you ask them to look for something that's lost, right? Usually, if we're not motivated to find that thing, like the 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 ability to look is like right at eye level. Usually, in our house, it's shoes, and I tell you what, we've never put shoes at eye level in our house. Never once, never once. And yet that's where we look for shoes. And so there's no motivation. So we look and look and they can't, and they never find the shoes. We never find the proof where the shoes are. And usually they're always right under our nose. 
we ask for signs. We ask for proof. We ask God to reveal himself. But are we really looking? Are you honestly looking for God? Matthew 16, 2 to 4, Jesus answer, says this. He answered them, when it is evening, you say it will be fair weather for the sky is red. And when in the morning, it will be a stormy day for the sky is red and threatening. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. So he left them and departed. What Jesus is saying, I, I don't know if you, uh, you are sailor types, or right, 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 you know this phrase, pink in the morning, a sailor's uh, warning, pink at night, a sailor's delight. We have that phrase. That's basically what Jesus is saying. Yeah, you know this phrase, and you know how to interpret the sky and say, uh-oh. Or, yeah, tomorrow will be a good day. You know how to do that. And yet, you can't see God in front of you in the moment at hand. Festerman says, right, the world is not lacking in wonders, but in a sense of wonder. The world is not lacking in wonders. All of this exists because God creates it. It is a wonder and a beauty. Every moment of it, we are dulled. We lose our imagination. And we've lost our wonder and awe. We lack the ability and the imagination to look and see. The Pharisees have no clue what God is doing or who he is. Do you know who God is? How do you know him? Do you know his heart? Do you know what he's doing right now? Here's the thing. I don't think God hides it. God is not trying to be a mystery in hiding who he is or what he's doing. Even right now. You want a hint of where you might find the answer? Open up his word. Open up the Bible. It reveals who he is. It reveals his will right now. Matthew 12, 40. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. They ask for a sign. He says he won't give them a sign. And then he says, accept the sign of Jonah. But you won't recognize it because you're too blind. You see, you can write the phrase, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. You can bring a Pharisee to Jesus, but you can't let them see God. It's the same with anyone else. You can bring your friend to church. You can re read the Bible with your family, but you can't recognize God for them. What is the sign of Jonah? What is Jesus saying that he's saying, I'll give you a sign. The sign of Jonah is simple. It's the death and resurrection. It's the death and resurrection. Jonah, the sign of Jonah. But you remember the story of Jonah? We've been preaching through Jonah and Nahum here. But if you don't know the son, remember the story. Jonah is, is literally or is symbolically dies in the whale. And for three days and three nights, he's in the belly of the whale, down into the depths of the abyss. And God is using that whale to try to turn Noah, uh, Jonah around because Jonah is not doing what God has asked him to do. And he's fleeing from God. And he'd rather be dead than do what God has asked him. And God has used that whale to kill the desires of Jonah and to give him new life and new birth and spits him out. Jonah is resurrected and then obeys. But if you know the story, sort of, not really. Mm, Jonah struggles. But that's the symbol. He dies, new life, and Jonah repents. Jonah disobeys. Jonah dies. Jonah is given new life and repents. The sign of Jonah. Jesus says, is saying, and he repeats it quite often, sometimes quite specifically to the disciples, I'm going to die. 
and in three days I'm going to be resurrected. Here he's being more obtuse to the people that can't recognize him, that should recognize him. He says, I'm going to give you the sign of Jonah, which means I'm going to die, and in three days and three nights I'm going to be resurrected. I'm going to come back to life. Yet they still won't believe, even when the resurrection happens right in front of them. We are looking for signs and wonders. And Jesus is present right in front of us. Would you believe the resurrection even if you saw it? Do you believe Jesus is present right here even if you can't see him? See, we often test God. We test God. Uh, This is the foxhole prayers in our life. When the hard times hit, we we ask God, desperate for help. If you do this, then I will believe. God, if you show up, I will be good. Show me, and I will believe. We've all had those some, some sort of those prayers in our lives. The reality is, that's the kind of prayer and thought that Gene Hillard had. God has done amazing things in your life. Sometimes we just don't recognize it. We just don't see his work. Or we don't remember it. Gene Hillard was saved from death. And she's asking, like, I just wasn't dramatic enough. I just think I don't remember it. If I, I expected more. See, we are expecting some kind of dramatic, entertaining experience of God. We're, we're hoping for Moses' burning bush. Then we'll get it. Here's the thing. You're not Moses. But God is present. He is present with you. God is working all the time. And the most ordinary way, the usual way God works is in the ordinary and the mundane in our lives, in the ones that we're overlooking. That's how God works. Only God works supernaturally and in incredible ways, only some of the times, for some people. But the ordinary works is through the ordinary order of all nature, of all the things that he has created the order of. The very fact that you are breathing is because God wills it to exist. So you do to take in lungs. Most of us don't even think about breathing. We just do it. Yet some of us struggle with our breathing. And when you struggle with your breathing, trust me, there's not much else you can think about but your breathing. Can I have one more breath? Every breath you take is a gift. We sing a song here, like, this is the air I breathe. Your holy presence living in me. And we we think that symbolic, but I'm telling you, it's literally every breath you take. God wills it to exist. All the things that are in your lives. All the encounters that you have in your life. It's because God is orchestrating those things to happen. Two weeks ago, in our sermon in Nahum, Come back, we'll be preaching Nahum next week. We learned that all of creation, all of the inanimate objects in creation, surpasses our ability to acknowledge God and worship him. We are blinded to God at times. The ones who are made in his image, they're meant to have this covenant special relationship and we will ignore and block it but creation never ignores god nahum 1 5 says the mountains quake before him the hills melt the earth heaves before him the world and all the it's an immediate response creation has the mountains and hill and all creation recognize jesus at the cross and they do not need a sign 
at the cross, Matthew 27, 50 through 51. And Jesus on the cross cried out with a loud cry and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. Inanimate objects responding to the death of Jesus. In Luke 23, 44 through 45, it was now about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, while the sun's light failed. The sun darkened. It turned off at the cross. Recognizing the light of the world is dying. Its creator is dying. If the mountains and hills can recognize Jesus, why can't we? Why can't you? Perhaps we've amused ourselves to death, lost our wonder and looking in the wrong places, or looking for the spectacular, the entertaining, instead of the ordinary moment-by-moment gifts that God gives us. Matthew 24, 24 says, For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders, so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. Are you being led astray by the spectacular, by the amazing, by the lights and man-made glamour of this world? A couple, uh, uh, about a month ago, we actually took the kids to Las Vegas to see you two in the sphere uh, incredible man-made device and show. Wow, it was amazing. Luke's quote about Las Vegas. And have you ever been to Las Vegas? Lots of lights, lots of glitter. He says this, It's amazing for all the wrong reasons. <laughs> We're now selling that to the trademarks of the city of Las Vegas. <laughs> See if we can make some money on that because I think they'll lean into that. We got a building to build here, so we got. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, any way possible. Are you being distracted and amazed by human made things that you don't notice God anymore? We're distracted by. I mean, this is the story of the Tower of Babel. Look what we can do. And when you compare it to what God does in the ordinary, It's silly. And perhaps we're not even looking for God. We're so distracted. Jesus goes on to say to the Pharisees, the people that should have recognized him and know him the most, he goes on to say him in Matthew 12, 41 through 42, the men of Nineveh, the enemies of God, will rise up at judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here, Jesus. The queen of the south will rise up in the judgment for this generation and condemn it. For she knew the ends of the earth, he he came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, something greater than Solomon here. Jesus, Solomon, had Jesus' wisdom in part. Jesus is the wisdom. He is God. It's all his wisdom. The outsiders, those don't know know God, they repent it. The enemies of God, they repent it. And those that are closest don't. That which is greatest, the greatest priest, the greatest prophet, the king of kings. Jesus is greater than the temple. He was the temple in which they worship God in. He was present right before them. And they do not recognize him. They're not even looking for him. Jesus is telling them, I am the invisible God in all his words and his actions. I am the visible God, the invisible God made visible. I am the God that is with you. And look at, I'm going to die, I'm going to be resurrected, and you're still not going to believe. What do you need to recognize Jesus? Here's the point I want you to take away. Life is filled with trouble, pains, and hardship. 
but it's also filled with joy and beauty and goodness. But inevitably, the hardships happen. The troubles happen for us. And maybe you're in that moment right now. Maybe you're in a, a hard place right now. One of the great honors and privileges of, of my job is people come share their hard places with me. People usually don't come share their joyous good moments with me. Sometimes they do. But mostly they come share their hard moments because that's when they need someone to walk with them. Look, it's one of my greatest honors that I actually get to hear people in their hard places. I don't get to solve people's hard places, but I get to be with them in a moment. And those moments, as you know, those hard places, they consume our minds. They consume everything about those moments. It, it, it's like a fog we live in in those hard places, those painful places. And it's hard to see, and it's hard to hear, and it's hard to recognize the presence of God in those places. Because those moments are overwhelming to us. And I'm not saying it's impossible to recognize God or possible to see God in those places. I'm just saying it's really hard. But here's the thing. God is in those hard moments. But God is also in the ordinary moments. He's in every moment with us. Most of us are like Gene Hillard. We're expecting these huge, grand gestures for God to reveal himself. And God is just sitting there, I'm right here. Didn't you just see me do this? Didn't you just take in a breath? Didn't you just make it home safely? The reality is God reveals himself in all these ordinary moments, in the kindness of a smile, the random acts of grace that we don't even recognize, that go undetected in our lives. You want to know how to recognize God in the ordinary? The answer is yes, you do want to know. You want to know how to recognize God in the ordinary? Yes. Oh man, sorry I believed you. You want to know how to recognize God in the ordinary moments of your life? Yes. All right, I'll tell you. I'll tell you. I've been waiting. Thanks for, thanks for asking. Train yourself in the ordinary to recognize him. Don't just expect that you're going to be able to do it. Train yourself in those ordinary moments to recognize them. Here's what I say. Come to church. Now, I go, you're a pastor. You're saying come to church. Hey, don't just believe me. Try it out. Come to church. Hear the gospel over and over again. Hear the word of God in his truth with his people over and over again. Not just this Sunday. Not just on the high church, but every Sunday. Right? The thing about, like I said, it, we Presbyterians, we celebrate the resurrection every Sunday. Every Sunday we hold this truth. Remind yourself every week. Every week. Be in the word. Be in God's word. He's not hiding himself or hiding his truth or hiding his will from you. Be in his word together. Listen to the God who loves you, who adores you, who's talking to you. Jesus is here. Jesus is present. Jesus is real, and he is God. And Jesus loves you. He loves you so much that he was willing to take your sin. And he was willing to die for your sin. When you practice to recognize Jesus in the ordinary. When the hard moments come, when the fog and the chaos and the moments it's hard to focus on God, you're going to be better able to see how God is working in those moments and how God is present with you in those moments and how God is in the storms and how maybe even God has led you into that storm in your life. I want to leave you with this parable from Soren Kierkegaard. Kierkegaard had this parable. It says, a crowded theater uh, hosted a variety show with various acts in it. Every act was more fantastic and, uh, than the next. It, it just created a louder and louder applause from the audience. And suddenly, after all these incredible acts with a greater fanfare, a clown came rushing to the stage. 
and, and, and the clown interrupted this thing. I said, I apologize for this interruption, but the theater is on fire. Everyone needs to leave. And the audience laughed it and erupted, thinking, ah, he's just part of the act. That clown's hilarious. They got problems because they think clowns are funny. All right, but that's one thing about the parable. But, but they, but in the, and he said, clowns like, no, no, I'm serious. It's on fire. You got to get out. And the audience is like, this guy's really committed to his act. And they just laughed and laughed. It got louder and louder. And he did it a third time. He's like, no, it's on fire. You need to leave. You're going to perish. And they laughed and laughed. And finally, the clown said, like, I got to get out or I'm going to perish. And so the clown left. And everyone else died. Kierkegaard concludes in this sovereign way. Our age will go down in a fiery destruction. Not to the sound of mourning, but to applause and cheering. To our own peril. Will we with our noses in our devices, desiring to be entertained, miss the presence of the ordinary God in ordinary ways right now? right in front of you. Will you recognize our Lord? Brothers and sisters, my plea to you is stay alert. Stay sober-minded by regularly being in God's word with God's people together. Let us pray. Gracious Father, Lord Jesus Christ, indwelling spirit. I give you thanks. We give you thanks that you are a God who is present with us, that you are a God that is for us, that you are a God that is working for us, that has worked for us. Lord, give us eyes and ears to see and hear and a desire of a heart desire to see and hear how you are present, how you are working. <laughs> Give us a desire to be with your people, your body of Christ. Give us a, a desire to be in your word together. Give us a desire to share with others and be in the world to tell others this good news and that the world is crashing down. To look up and that God is present. May we train ourselves not to be entertained, but to be present. To be present with you as you are present with us. Lord, I beg you for this mercy on us. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. I beg that please stand as able and join us. <laughs>
faith we together affirm today is the faith of the whole church. With all God's people, let us profess our faith in the triune God. Please join me in reciting the Apostles' Creed. We believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. We believe in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. This table is God's gift to us. It remembers that he died and was resurrected for us. It reminds us that he feeds us presently, that he is active, that Jesus is present at this table, and we come to it as a, a proclamation of faith, of who he is and what he's done. We welcome all baptized Christians who, for, who sincerely repent of their sins, who profess Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, who are members of a gospel proclaiming church universal to receive the sacrament with us today. Let us pray. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon this gift of this bread and this cup that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Jesus Christ. By your Holy Spirit, make us one with Jesus that we may be one with all who share this feast, united in ministry in every place, as this bread is Christ's body for us. Send us out to be the body of Christ in the world. Lord, fulfill your eternal purpose in us and in all the world. Keep us faithful in your service until Christ comes in final victory. All glory and honor are yours, our mighty Father, now and forever. And now with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray as he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us our day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took the bread after he blessed it and said, this is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup and said, drink of it, all of you, for this cup is the new covenant in my blood poured out for the remission of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. In just a moment, I'm going to invite you forward in two lines to receive the bread, take the bread when you receive it, and then you peel out to the side and you will receive the cup, take the cup when you receive it. If you are unable, by how I fence the table, to receive the sacrament with us, I want you to know that Christ died for you as well. And that you are welcome to come forward, just put a, a sign and we'll give you a blessing as well. The serving elders come forward.
ready. and for all the Father's love. He is the light in the darkness who took our flesh and took our place. The weight of the world on His shoulders. The weight of the world on His shoulders. and for all our debt is paid there on the cross it is finished the Lamb of God for us was slain up from the grave he is risen up from the grave he is risen We believe. 
whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And he will come. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, you have fed us. And we are thankful. Allow us to be thankful this day and all our days. Help us to come with hearts made ready, eyes made open, hands made strong, feet made willing, and ears willing to listen, Lord. Help us to see you and know that you're present. Help us to do your will in this place and in all the places in which you give us existence. We pray this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thanks for much uh, coming. If you are a, a visitor here, we would love to get to know you. So you can pull out your cell phone right now. I know, crazy. Cell phone right now and text 299-2100, 299-2100. Text welcome. And uh, you can put a little, it'll give a little uh, uh, prompt for you to enter your information. Uh, we'll sell that to China and make a profit. No, no, no. <laughs> I will get that information and I will reach out to you directly. Uh, we would love to, I would love to connect to you and know your story. Uh, we would love for you to join us next week. If you're, if you're looking for a church or in the area, uh, we would just be so grateful uh, to you be part of our community uh, in that way. Uh, you can also text a prayer during the week to that number. Uh, just text what you want to that, to that number, and we will pray for you, and the elders will pray for you as well. Hey, encourage you after the service. Normally, we have food and fellowship after the service. Today's a little bit different, uh, but we encourage you, if you want to take a picture here on this beautiful cross that you guys made, uh, we would love for you to do that. Come line up here, and uh, we'll create those. If you haven't got a selfie with me, do not leave until you get a selfie with me. Like, we need these selfies. Very important tradition. Um, hey, I want to invite you next week to join us as well. Uh, we've been going through a sermon series of Jonah and Nahum. Um, so next week we have our Sunday school at 9 a.m. and service at 1010, Sunday school night, and then food and fellowship after that. Th next week we'll actually, InterVarsity Springfield will be here for a moment for mission uh, during Sunday school and in the service. Uh, so come uh, hear about what InterVarsity Springfield is doing, a ministry to college campuses. It's pretty amazing what's been going on. Uh, also, uh, on April 14th, uh, we have our normal Sunday school and service here, but we're having a combined worship Sunday, Sunday evening uh, at 6 p.m. at Pioneer Valley Baptist Church. Uh, these three churches that uh, I meet with their pastors on a regular basis uh, to study and for kind of accountability. Uh, so we decide to have these kind of maybe uh, three times a year service. I will be preaching that night, uh, so I'll know if you're here there or not. I'll be looking because I'll be preaching right at you. Um, so, and it will be a sermon that you probably have not heard. Uh, uh, so you don't be expecting me to recycle one. It'll be a new one, so come, come hear it. Uh, that never happens. Never happens, recycle sermon. Hey, we have a women's ministry called Herd. It meets every other Monday. Not this Monday, but the next Monday. Not this Monday, the next Monday. Say yes, Liz. Thank you. All right, yeah. Uh, men's night is next week, April 7th at 6.30 p.m. We have dinner, usually a fantastic dinner. Uh, and then fellowship, and then uh, a man shares his testimony. I encourage you to come out to that 630 to 8 right here at the church uh, Sunday night. Um, and we have community groups in this church that meet on a rotating basis uh, twice a month. Uh, if you want to be involved in those community groups, one on Friday, one on Tuesday, right, Tuesday? Uh, you can text uh, groups to 299-2100. Uh, elders, raise your hand. All right. Look around, people, if you have an elder near you. Uh, if you want prayer or if you want to talk more about Jesus, reach out to these people right after the service. I'm an elder, too. You can reach out to me. Uh, they, all of them, would love to pray or talk to you. All right. Would you please stand? Brothers and sisters, Jesus is present. He is active. He is working for you. Hallelujah. He is risen. Hallelujah. He is risen. Hallelujah. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. 